Hello and welcome to the Angerati studio here at ITRON Utility Week. Uh, it's lunchtime, so it's a bit quieter for this <laughs> for this interview. We're joined now by John uh, Yelland, who's the Vice President of uh, Global Marketing and International Sales at ABB. Uh, John, first off, welcome. Thanks for making Thank the time to be here. And, uh, you know, ABB is a huge, massive company, uh, and your part of it deals with the uh, wireless and mesh networking uh, and so on. And we're talking a little bit off air. Uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, ABB's philosophy on that subject and where you're coming from, because there's quite a few players who do the same thing. Yeah. Or similar well, I things. Would, uh, <laughs> I would counter that they do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, to sum it up in one word, it's all about interoperability. So our strategy is built around interoperability, meaning that we will work with multiple different vendors' devices, multiple generations of those vendors' devices, uh, and would also provide the ability for customers, utility customers in particular, to preserve the investments they've already made in their legacy networks. Many of our customers, for example, have invested in smart metering or AMI, Advanced Metering Infrastructure Communications Networks, which is fine for taking back the meter data for billing purposes or for controlling the meters for instant on, uh, remote switch on and off, and all the customer benefits that that has, you know, being able to switch a meter on or off inside of 30 minutes 24 seven is a great benefit to customers. No longer does somebody who's just purchased a new house have to make an appointment and wait around for a guy to come from the utility to put the power back on what may be days later. Equally, somebody that didn't pay their bill, okay, they can now phone up with a credit card or whatever, make a payment and get the power reinstalled instantly instead of again having to wait. So, so when you are talking about uh, interoperability and uh, that comes with an open standards approach, I would imagine. Um, and why... It, you know, why, why is that different? I mean, I, uh, I, it seems to me that why wouldn't you go down that route? Uh, so, you know, can, can you just tell us a little bit of background of why people haven't and uh, what should make them think about it and, and make that switch? Absolutely. So if we stick with the analogy around the smart meters for now, um, many different vendors put together proprietary systems that didn't communicate or work with each other's smart metering systems, which was okay at the time, you know, for getting smart metering out there. What's happening next, and increasingly, is that our utility customers are deploying additional applications, feeder automation, distribution automation applications, uh, outage management, substation automation, mobile worker applications, surveillance and security, and so on and so on and so on. And many of them are finding that the single purpose network that they put in place already to read the meters and to provide those meter services that we talked about is not adequate to provide either the level of security, the bandwidth or the low latency required for many of those distribution automation applications that they now want to add on. This is where the interoperability comes in. Because you want the right device for the right use case, you don't want to have to buy everything from one hardware vendor's stack because it might not be it the right one. It won't be compatible, it may not be the right technology. So what we're saying is that we will make multiple different wireless technologies, field area network technologies, neighborhood area network technologies work together and we can actually design and build a network for our customers where we've got the right technology for the right use case. Narrowband mesh for the meter reading, broadband mesh to do the backhaul from the meter reading, aggregating from millions of meters all the way back to the core fiber network and back to the control center. That broadband mesh layer at the same time providing very low latency, one millisecond per hop, which is great for applications like outage management, fault detection, isolation and recovery, as well as providing the bandwidth for applications like video surveillance um, and providing the security with a firewall in every device so that that distribution utilities network can't be taken over by a bad actor. And, and that low latency thing is coming through very, very 
uh, you know, in a, in a huge way, and on some of the other interviews, especially when you put uh, intelligence on the edge, you know, you need the uh, you need that framework. So, so tell me, you know, you mentioned at the top that, and I I want to dive into the value of it. So, if I can replay what you just said, you know, the, the value of having a network like this is that it can uh, work for a, a whole raft of use cases and where the existing AMI single network is maybe just fit for polling. So what would you say to a utility that says, uh, how, how do I go back either to my regulator or whatever and say, hey, I, I need to put this in, and they say, well, you've already got this, this, this network. I mean, are you, how do the two play, and, and how can a, a, a utility build out a roadmap where they might say, okay, we're going get, to get rid of this AMI network over the course of time? I mean, how, how does that work in practice? Yeah, in practice, um, it's the key drivers that are really driving the utilities that matter. You know, first off is their customers, their consumers, whether they're commercial um, users of the electricity or the home consumers. Um, it's the service level to those customers. It's the outage management, so you know, if there are outages, which is inevitable, to minimize the number of people affected and for how long they're affected for. You know, those are the kind of the basic requirements. There are key performance indicators at the utilities that actually look at those parameters. You know, what's the quality of the power you're providing? What's the uptime and the availability? How quickly do you fix it? What's the level of customer satisfaction? And what are you doing to encourage the reduction in the emission of carbon gases and to integrate the renewables, whether it's private, solar, or wind, uh, or hydropower, or whether it's commercial provided power for this, coming from you know, renewables like you know, the wind, um, you know, solar farms, and so on and so forth. Are, are you saying that it's almost like a, a, a cost of doing business to have the type of network that you're describing for a modern utility? It's, is, it, is it that much of a no-brainer? I, I mean, I, w I wouldn't actually describe it as a cost of doing business. I would say it's an opportunity to reduce operations and maintenance costs out throughout the rest of the organization. That's what IT, that's what the technology is bringing. And this comes from minimizing truck rolls, from getting intelligence and eyes into your distribution network, understanding um, how to locate faults in the smart grid as quickly as they occur, to isolate them remotely from the control center, to be able to send a crew directly to where that fault is to go and fix or replace, instead of days of outage the old way, with a lot of manual looking and searching and testing, Frequently in the olden days, it was the customers who called the utility, um, not once but in their thousands, to say the power's out. Now the utility is going to know it and advise the customers. So the communication now can flow the other way because we've got this network in place. Yep. And, 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 and how do you see this uh, uh, then working with the uh, sort of uh, existing metering infra infrastructure? I mean, are, are you seeing this? So let me tell you where this question uh, uh, comes from. So five years ago, I did a number of interviews with meter manufacturers, and they said, well, we're never going to agree on one standard, and IP and IPMP LS is out of the question. Now, more and more, that conversation has changed. You know, are you seeing that this industry is really going into a, a much more common standards place based world. And what opportunity does that give people then? You know, are we, are we going to see much more swapping out of manufacturers and, and devices than we've seen up until now? Yeah, we've got a, a few dynamics at play. Hmm. Um, the Wysun Alliance uh, is really the leading body that's leading on standards for the narrow band mesh or the RF canopy. Um, meter mesh as it's otherwise known and most of the major manufacturers, most of the major vendors including ABB and ITRON for example are active members of the Wysun Alliance developing those common standards. We are moving away from the days of silo proprietary systems um, and then the other thing that's happening that's driving... So you driving think the Wysun uh, piece is, is going to be the, the, the de facto one and the others are going to fall away? Uh, I think there will be, be a, uh, a period of transition for some time to come. 
the way that we're addressing the customer needs during this period of transition is to really understand that our utilities, um, they're all starting from a place of legacy. Nobody anywhere anymore is a greenfield site. They've made investments in these uh, AMI networks, smart metering networks. We can help to preserve that investment and help them over time to migrate to the future standard. And that's what we're doing with our participation in YSUN, the work that we're doing with ITRON, the work that we're doing with SilverSpring, the work that we're doing with others in the industry, so that we can bring this interoperability into play, allowing, first of all, the utilities to use multiple manufacturers' devices, multiple meters, they can have choice now. Uh, we can apply the right technologies for the right use cases and the right applications. And then we can also make sure that the investment doesn't get ripped and replaced, which nobody wants to do because you've got to keep the electricity flowing and you've got to keep billing and you've got to keep the service levels up. But that we can go a step at a time, we can overbuild those legacy networks, we can integrate them into an end to end network that we can provide, all of which is managed out of a single pane of glass at the control center where the operator can see a Google Maps visualization of every wireless device in that network so, so and you, manage them yeah. and control them. So, so are you uh, also uh, potentially exploring the model whereby ABB uh, runs and maintains this, this network as a service? So it, it's not just, you know, selling the uh, control software for the mesh, but also providing it as a service. I mean, is that something that you've done or, or are looking to do? Uh, absolutely right, great question. Um, and the tide has really turned in the last couple of years, I would say. Uh, you know, initial conversations with our utility customers and partners was they really wanted to run and control their own network and nobody else was gonna be running it for them for reasons of security, control, etc. Now what we're seeing um, that with the shift in the workforce, you know, the aging workforce, uh, we're seeing development in terms of the levels of security that can be provided. Uh, we've got, you know, the oncoming surge in the number of devices and the amount of data that's expected to flow through the smart grid. So it really needs specialists who are in that field to run and manage it and the conversation now becomes, hey, do we bring those skills in or do we go somewhere where they already exist and let these guys do it? Do you build or buy? This yeah. is the dilemma. So yeah. what we can do is we can work with our utility customers however they want to work. We can subcontract, we can design the network, we can deploy the network, we can tune that network, we can train them how to manage that network and then step back and provide warranty, support, software maintenance. On the other end, if a utility, as some utilities have started to ask us now, want us to come in and manage that network for them on site as a service within their domain, we can provide that service as well. Because I would imagine that for you, you can do that remotely, right? It, do, it doesn't mean that you have to send staff in on site. It, it, it can, all of this can be done away. It can be done away, the technology is not the issue here. It's, it's more the, the business case <laughs> right. um, and the desire of the utility customers. Yeah. Um, I really see it transitioning from, you know, we build, we deploy, we train, we do the knowledge transfer, then we step back and support. You know, we're moving forward now. Um, I would say that the leading edge um, of the development with our utility customers is we, we, we come in to augment their telecommunications department or their IT department um, and work for them, managing the network for them on their premises. So even. it's interesting that you say that and I'm getting signals so that we're, we're coming to the end of our time. I mean, but in your opinion, from what you're seeing on the ground, you know, do are you really seeing that change in thinking where utilities are going, you know what, this is going to get so complex, let's sub it out rather than try and do it ourselves because one of the things which I find you know kind of interesting is effectively from an operational standpoint one utility isn't that different from another one by and large because uh, you're dealing with the electron which you know, yeah. does, it doesn't change yeah it, it, it just it would just make sense to be able to just make it someone else's problem and, and we worry about the stuff that we want to get good at 
is that really happening? I mean, I know theoretically people have written about it, but I, I'm still struggling to find a use case where that has actually happened. Yeah, um, certainly in my experience, there's a lot of people talking about it. There's a lot of people thinking about it. There's a lot of folks concerned about the massive increase in the amount of data and all the applications um, that the utilities would like to layer onto their networks. And it's going to be huge, complex networks, as you rightly point out. Um, is anybody of any significant size already today operating in a mode where they kind of completely hand over the responsibility for the deliverables that come from that network? Not yet. It's not yet at the point where it's simply paid for as a, you know, a remote cloud service on a monthly basis or an annual basis or anything like that. But you can see it happening. The technology is absolutely there. The technology can allow it to happen. And as soon as the and utilities the business case are ready would stack to move, up in your mind? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's a, you could even move to a, uh, you know, a results-based pricing model. If we look at the, you know, at the top of the utility, we look at their key performance indicators, delivering a certain quality of power with a certain uptime, with you know, minimum outages, there's a, you know, a whole load of parameters here, accuracy of billing, number of meters read on time accurately, et cetera, et cetera. You know, an operator could come in, operator for hire, and say, okay, the more we exceed that set of targets, and the more we reduce your O&M cost, we'll get paid on a percentage of that performance. So the model is there. Right now, as you rightly say, it's kind of theoretical. The technology is there to support it. It's very much a case of um, who's going to go first. You know, utilities are rightly um, a little bit conservative right. when it comes to, you know, health and safety issues, cybersecurity. Is there you know, still a regulatory so change on. that also needs to happen before that model? Because, you, you know, you have regulatory environments where the utility is really, uh, uh, you know, rewarded for the asset base and, uh, 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 you know, and so on, and uh, very sort of capex type investment. And, right. and what we're talking about here is an opex. It's an opex model. Uh, yeah. Type yeah. investment. Yeah. yeah uh, do, do you think that that just needs a final change before we can actually see wireless as a service? Well, there are different models in different utilities, even within the US, certainly internationally. Sometimes the utilities are government owned or they're owned by the king or whatever, and they can do whatever they like within reason. Um, if we look uh, you know, at North America, if we look in particular at investor owned utilities, you're absolutely right. You know, um, a capex investment is looked upon typically more favorably and driving down OPEX to zero, if possible, is really the pressure and the way that the rewards are stacked today, um, especially with the regulatory framework that's in place. So that in itself is going to encourage utilities to make investments in a privately owned network as opposed to pay um, an ongoing fee for a service, which would clearly be uh, an operational expense, an ongoing OPEX expense. On that note, John, I think we'll leave it. Uh, you heard it here first, wireless as a service coming to you. <laughs> uh, but no, genuinely, it would be great to, you know, in a couple of years' time, talk about you know, something actually uh, uh, being in place in that way, because I think it makes immense sense. Uh, so thank you for joining us, and uh, thank you as well for watching.